All right, so good morning. This is uh, January 14th. Um, this is our second session yeah. of our I have a mom and developmental school education, adult basic education, Saturday um, affinity group. Right. She also has a kid that she wants to put in level one at the same time. Can they still do it even though they already started? Okay, so this is this is there, is is there an opening in the level one? I, think yourself, if you will. I don't care if she wants to pay for it. We better mute first, I think. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, we'll get started again. Uh, good morning, Russell Frankel here with the um, uh, facilitator for the uh, DAVAD ABE partnership affinity groups. We're, we're delighted that you could be here on this snowy Minnesota day. And uh, this is the second session that we've had. Yesterday, we had an excellent session. Uh, we anticipate and expect that today will also be an ec ec excellent session, and we thank you for your participation today. And we're going to dive right into it because we've got two presentations today, and we just want to make sure they have all the time they need to share with you some really incredible information. Um, I'm going to hand it off at this time to Leslie Blicker, my um, co-conspirator in this work, and she's going to, of course, introduce herself. And, um, and then she's going to um, kind of kick things off. But before we do that, I just would ask everybody who's in this space to in chat, introduce yourself, your name, your role, your organization. And then if you're new to this group, this is your first time, uh, please indicate that as well. So welcome, thank you so much. And Leslie, um, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Um, some of you who are attending today are panelists. So we welcome you as well and thank you for being on hand. It might be your first affinity group meeting that you're um, at least participating in. So let me go ahead and uh, just share. Let me, uh, let me help you with that. No, it was already set up. Right. That's yep. good, great. Yep. Karen must have done that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, let me get, I'm just getting the chat window up. Okay, yep, so good morning. We did have a session yesterday and as many of you know, we tend to repeat them one day after another with similar content. But what was different this time around is we had two different groups of panelists yesterday from what we're going to have today. And so what's really exciting is all in all, we're getting four partnership teams to discuss and talk about their partnerships. And any of you are welcome to watch the recording of yesterday if, if you wish, and if you weren't there. I think one or two of you might be have attended yesterday and you're here today. So uh, that's wonderful that you could spend that time. Um, the focus today um, and the idea clearly has come up from prior meetings is that uh, while last year we looked at math partnerships primarily, um, today we're looking at partnerships uh, involving English, reading, writing, or study skills, or some combination thereof, and how the partnerships are doing it, working with the students, varies from school to school and ABE to ABE. So it's interesting to see the variety of, of methodologies being used. So before we get into it, uh, just so you know, I'm going to give a really a two minute update on what Russ and I have been working on to further this partnership work. Um, and the format for today is a little different than we've done in the past. We're going to operate by a true panel discussion format. Um, however, first, each team, I'm calling them teams, has been asked to provide about a seven minute overview. I know that sounds rather precise. And just so you know, <coughs> Uh, for those of you who are able to speak and multitask and watch the chat, I will give you about a one minute warning when your seven minutes, seven or eight minutes are almost up. Otherwise, I'll just gently uh, chime in and say we need to wrap it up. Don't worry if you if the person providing the overview hasn't covered everything because then we'll be followed by a fairly uh, ample amount of time of a, of a moderated panel discussion and some of what you might have said would probably come up in your responses to those questions. I'm moderating the overview and then Russ will take it over and moderate the panel discussion. 
Then we're gonna leave 10 minutes at the end for any follow-up questions. And we really have about two minutes at the very end just to remind you about future meetings. So uh, having said that, the updates for the work we're working on, as you know, I'm gonna start with the second bullet first. Uh, at the very last meeting, we were asking everyone to give us feedback on the toolkit. I had indicated I thought I was gonna be able to, to revise it, shorten it, and get it up on the website by the end of the year. And I've missed the mark somewhat. Uh, we're knee deep into it now. And uh, we finished maybe uh, a third to, by the end of today, hopefully a half of it. Um, but I've really taken all of your comments to heart and we'll, we should have a completed toolkit before too long up on the website. So um, it's been a process though. There's, there's a lot of work to it. The Minnesota State Innovation Funding Last year, those of you who participated in uh, the affinity group last year, uh, I don't know if you remember, but Russ and I, um, in co-sponsorship with uh, Northland Community College, went after, uh, it's a $10,000 grant basically from Minnesota State. It's their innovation funding uh, program that they've done for several years. And we're gonna do that again this year. Uh, and it's really to further this work uh, now that we have done the hard work of a toolkit and we have resources available for people, we want to be able to, to bring it out, make sure that it lives and it breathes. And we've got some ideas that were generated by the affinity group last time. Something like maybe uh, creating uh, learning circles, you know, that people can work on. Or we've still been talking about a mentoring program or <clears throat> some webinars. So we're going to be applying for that and it's due next week. So uh, we'll keep you posted. So with that, uh, we've got the panelists. I just wanted to show everyone who presented yesterday, not the names, but at least the ABE college combo. So we had the Southeast ABE uh, folks along, some of the folks along with Rochester Community and Technical College, otherwise known as RCTC. And I've put just the contact, the person I worked with in order to get the team panels, the, the panelists ready. And that was Nadine and I spelled it wrong, it's Holt House. So <clears throat> um, at Hawthorne Education Center. And then we had uh, another partnership also with Southeast ABE along with Riverland College. Uh, and they did a wonderful job. It was uh, fascinating to hear. And then today we have uh, the Mankato area ABE along with South Central College. And uh, the person I've been working with is Karen Walters and she's here today. And then uh, AEOA, for those of you who know that we're up in the Northeast part of the state, along with Hibbing Community College and Tracy, my, uh, my wing woman, for that part of the state uh, has done a wonderful job kind of uh, getting folks together. And I'm not going to introduce your team members, but instead I'm going to ask each of you. So let me just tell you how this will work. I'll call on Karen first to introduce your team members. Um, and then I'll have you do your seven minute overview. And then Tracy, you'll follow up. I'll ask you to introduce your uh, team members as well with your seven minute follow up. So having said that, I'd like to introduce Karen Walters and uh, let your overview begin. Thank you, Leslie. Um, my name is Karen Walters. I coordinate Mankato Adult Basic Education. And today we will have um, four members of our team uh, talk. Uh, Rick Kurtz is the Dean of Liberal Arts and Sciences uh, from South Central College. Rick, you might want to just wave a little bit. Um, Thomas Maldonado is the English for, Ac uh, English for Academic Purposes EAP instructor at South Central College. And Tom Tashney is uh, the Adult Basic Ed instructor for Mankato ABE. So we have a Thomas and a Tom. And they're actually both Thomases, but we call Thomas Maldonado Thomas and we call Tom Tashney Tom so that we can keep them straight. Um, so I've been asked to give you just a little background about our partnership and how we got started. Um, Mankato and South Central College actually do have a very long standing partnership, but it hasn't necessarily been with developmental ed. Um, we started partnering way back prior to 2007 
with things like GED testing on campus. Uh, we had a college prep program that started in 2007 called MindQuest Academy. And all of that work was pre-college where ABE was co-located on the campus. Um, after we had years of MindQuest Academy, um, we started doing career pathway work through the fast track grants um, through the Joyce Foundation initiative. And we did, we still do adult career pathway work on campus with Pathways to Prosperity grants. And so when the developmental education strategic roadmap and the legislation started coming down to Minnesota State, that is when we actually started looking closely at how are we can we work closer with developmental education and the person who was in rick's position prior to rick her name was judy Scholes. she and i were talking about this desr roadmap that was coming and we started talking about how college prep fits into that and we decided that we needed to ramp that up so we worked together to write a grant to the Otto Bremer Foundation. And we came up with a program called Right Start. And the intent of Right Start was to offer both pre-college, college prep work on campus and to offer integrated instruction in some of the developmental education courses. Um, we had been doing integrated instruction with our career pathway fast track work and we thought that model was very successful and we wanted to try that with developmental ed. And unlike a lot of um, partnerships, we have not had a struggle in our partnership with um, competing with developmental ed. Our developmental and ABE teachers have been very, um, worked very well together. When we had a college prep program, we would go talk to them and ask them what they thought we should be doing and how we should be helping students prepare for college. We asked for their expertise um, and we felt, you know, welcomed on campus. We always have been very welcomed on campus. And a lot of the work that we had been doing since 2007 set precedence for how this partnership would, would happen. Um, so we decided to integrate four different classes. We started with English for Academic Purposes. And the nice part about working with that program was they were just starting English for Academic Purposes at the same time that we got this grant. And so they were, it was new for them. We wanted to work with them. Um, we had the ESL classes going at our ABE site and had some expertise and we worked together with the person who started the EAP classes on campus. Um, we also integrated uh, for that first grant, we integrated uh, English classes, English developmental ed classes, reading developmental ed classes and math. So that grant lasted for two years and ended in May of 2021. And the main focus of that grant was really to establish the partnership. We had agreed that we would have uh, quarterly meetings. We would um, get our teachers to work together try to find where, where we would fit. We tried study sessions after class, before class. We tried having the teachers in the classroom the whole time. Um, we started working with the academic support center um, and all the tutoring that was going on and trying to find out like, where does ABE fit here within the parameters that ABE can provide support on campus and where are the needs for those students? And it was a lot of getting to know each other, you know, teachers getting to know each other, working together. Um, we did start out with that grant, having some bridge pre-college courses and found uh, that students really were not enrolling in those. Um, you know, we had students coming to the college, knocking on the door, wanting to be in college that needed help. And they were not interested in going backwards. They were not interested in doing pre-college work or going to ABE or even doing ABE on campus. They really wanted to be in classes and be a college student. However, if students were at the ABE site thinking about going to college, they were more than willing to do college prep 
because they were already in ABE and saw this as a, a way to stay a little longer and get their skills up a little higher. So we had kind of two things happening. One was people coming to the college, not wanting to go back to ABE and some coming up from ABE may be willing to stay a little longer and get their skills ready. Um, so once we got past the grant period, we decided our best way to use our existing funding and support students was for EAP and math. Those were the classes that had the most um, needs, daily maintenance of students needing help. Um, so Rick and I talked about, you know, this grant is ending and what are we gonna do from here? And he decided he would fund the math classes and I decided I would fund the EAP classes out of the AB budget. So that's how we're funding our classes right now. We do keep students at the ABE site longer in the GED classes for some college prep work or advanced ESL at our ABE site can stay longer and do college prep work there. But right now on campus, our developmental work is integrated with, with developmental ed. So what that looks like right now is integrated instruction, meaning that the ABE teacher is in the classroom with the college teacher um, working together. They decide between them how that works. And we're going to talk more about that in another question. Um, but we, uh, we are on campus and we are working with the classes in the, in their classroom and in the, in the local study center on campus. Great. My apologies for sending the one minute out to the whole group, but Karen, I saw you saw it. So thank you. Yeah, Great. I started a timer here myself. So I saw it going. And I was like, oh, I got to cut it off. <laughs> I love when people can think on the fly and not get too flustered, you know. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, great job. Very interesting. Uh, and it sounds quite robust as well. So with that, um, I would call on Tracy then, and if you would introduce your folks and uh, do the same thing. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce everyone from AEO and um, HCC, and then I will have Terry, Donna, and Jill kind of get into that um, of answering those questions because they are front lines and they can definitely do a better job than I can. So um, on the HCC side, we have in attendance, Erin um, Rainey, who is the provost at Hibbing Community College, Jessalyn Sabin, who is the academic dean, and Donna, Donna Grottam. I think I said that right, right, Donna? Pretty close, Bretham. Okay, and she is the counselor at HCC. And then on the AEOA side, we have Terry Ferris and Jill Carlson, who are the adult ed instructors. And so I'll let you guys take it from here. So my name is, like Tracy said, my name is Donna Gretham, and I'm the counselor here at HCC. And our partnership started, I think about 10 or 11 years ago when AVE came to us and said, how can we help? And similar to um, Mankato, we um, put together a learning community. And so our students who test developmental, so they test into a um, refresher English reading math class, we would put those, those students in the same group and then they would also pair it with the study skills. And that's where myself and the other counselor, Lisa Bestel came in and we'd teach the study skills classes. So those students were all in the same group together. And then with our study skills class, we added a lab portion. So one to two days a week, students, depending on which program they're in, will go and meet with Jill or Terry just to keep working on some of those skills, Jill and Terry know what's going on in their classes. So then, you know, did you get your English paper done? Can I help you proof your English paper? And then the other thing that we do is once a week, we sit down as a team. So it's myself, Jill, Terry, um, instructors from English, um, reading and law enforcement as part of our, our learning community. And we meet to say, you know, how's this student doing? How's this student and kind of just putting together that safety net to keep our students on track and, and help people before they 
they get lost in the system. So that's just a brief overview of, of how we of how we work. Yeah, in answering the questions about um, what classes we teach, um, we kind of we started out in addition to this, the labs that we do with um, college success strategies, we did a college prep math and a college prep reading and writing. And that's really how we start out before we got into the integrated model where um, last year, Jill was in the, um, I have a note so I can remember the intro to comp and reading essentials class helping the instructor. I am in a um, intro, uh, what do we call it? College, our law enforcement prep program where the law enforcement instructor is doing the law enforcement material and I am helping with the reading skills because the students who are in there don't have the reading skills necessary to get through the program. Um, and the law enforcement instructor knows law enforcement, not how to teach reading. Um, Jill, did I miss anything? No, I think that's probably about it. I think um, our model is very fluid and it changes um, almost semester to semester as what the, what the what maybe Donna might come up with, maybe what we come up with, maybe an instructor taps into and says, hey, you know, it's very, very fluid. And we did lose one of the teacher that I was um, co kind of sitting in with on her class. Um, and so now I'm not in the classroom, but I'm still working with those students on their work. And that is just something, you know, like I said, it's very fluid. It, it changes daily as to the needs of the students. And we are located here on the Hibbing Community College campus. Um, we are very lucky to have some support, support from the top. Um, oh, yes. The president of NEHAD down to Jesslyn and Erin Rainey are our awesome leaders here on campus. Um, they, we started out in a building that was kind of off the beaten path. We had limited space and they wanted us more visible. So they gave us a fabulous room, which used to be the academic center. Jesslyn, it's, it's really a bad room. Don't give it to anybody else. No. Um, but no. a fabulous room. We have a lot of space. They gave us technology so that we could do Zoom classes. If um, we had students that needed to learn remotely, it's, it's amazing. And I'm gonna have Jessalyn talk a little bit about how her plan for us expanding to other colleges in the NEHEAD system. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, I, I, I've been lucky to be involved in this from the instructor side too, um, when I was teaching. So I just know how valuable the conversations with Donna, Jill and Terry are when it comes to, um, you know, really figuring out where an individual student is at. Um, we're looking at because we're part of a district of colleges that are merging in, uh, in the next few months, we are, are looking at how we can expand um, these services. I know that, um, you know, Tracy has folks that she's hiring on that are, are joining us, for example, up at Rainy River Community College, which is another campus that I serve. Um, and, and she's brought us into the hiring process. Uh, we've looked at space uh, for, for the individual that we just recently hired up there um, and, and some of this uh, technology supports as well. So we're hoping to really establish strong connections on each of our, our sister campuses uh, as part of this new college. Um, our, our merger is going to include um, Rainy River Community College and International Falls, ITASC Community College in Grand Rapids, Mesabi Range College at both the Virginia and Eveleth uh, campuses, um, uh, Hibbing and, and Vermilion at, up in Ely. So um, we're, we're, it's been a really great partnership and, and even as recently as earlier this week, Tracy and I were meeting to talk a little bit about even grant projects that we can uh, partner on and, and look at how we can move forward. Well, I just typed in about one minute. Does anyone have a one minute's worth of anything to say or should we move on to the uh, panel? You can move on to the panel. Okay, well, thank you everyone. You know, I met with this team, uh, I'll use the one minute, um, as a way to understand maybe how some of the English reading, writing uh, partnerships were working. I met with the team, 
but they were all in their lab together wearing masks. So I have to tell you, it's good to see your faces now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, Russ, I think at this point, I'll turn it over to you. We have until 11 o'clock or so, uh, maybe 11.05, uh, and right. go ahead. So thanks, Leslie. And I, I just want to thank the group for, for coming today and being engaged and contributing um, your, your exceptional partnerships. Um, I, it's time for me to get to work, I guess. So, um, so I'm going to just start posing a few questions to, to our groups. And it's, it's going to be rather informal. I just want to draw you out. I just want to make sure that each of you has your opportunity to kind of share your perspective and uh, um, what you would like the group to know. So our first question for the group um, is this, what does each side of the partnership, uh, ABE, DevEd, bring to the partnership? What kind of unique skills or expertise uh, would you say? And so let's get started, I think, with our group from the Mankato area. Hi, hi, this is Rick. I guess um, I'll start off, but I'll, then I'll, I'll hand it over and actually to give more of a, a micro view examples here to Thomas and Tom. But I, I think uh, first off, we just, we both bring resources, uh, personnel and otherwise that none of us could do alone. And so Thomas and Tom, if you could talk about that a little bit with your uh, classroom experience. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, for myself, one area that really was, that worked out great for both Tom and myself, and, and Tom can speak to this as well, is the fact that we both have worked together in the past. We worked at the uh, Minnesota State and the IEP program. Uh, so we knew each other already. We already uh, had that familiarity with working with students uh, working in this area of TESOL. And uh, myself, I have my background in TESOL. I've worked with international students before. Uh, I've taught two years in Saudi Arabia. And um, <clears throat> also just the, um, just what I had been working with prior when the program was just getting started in 2019, my knowledge of how the courses functioned. And then just with this idea of me and Tom, myself as the instructor, and then Tom is being uh, working in a tutor capacity of working with the students. And I'll let Tom speak a little bit to that as well. Yes, hello, uh, my name is Tom and um, uh, my role in the classroom, uh, as I see it, is to be a facilitator to uh, help the students. Thomas knows how to teach the class uh, and he, his job is to uh, follow his syllabus and make sure he's covering all the material. My job is to focus on the individual students and make sure that, that they are moving through the process. Um, I help them to navigate the technology, which is sometimes difficult for them with D2L and with their own uh, IT problems. I help individuals to understand the instruction that Thomas is giving. Uh, I look for individuals who might not understand the assignment that Thomas is giving. Uh, when we do classroom exercises, I assist individuals to understand those exercises and get started with them and move through them. Um, but then I also tutor students, uh, individual students in time after class, uh, when I work in, in the counseling capacity where I can tutor individuals or groups to work on their assignments, their writings, their readings. Um, so I help each student to uh, understand the process of what they're learning and to evaluate their needs and how they can build on what they already know. So my job is to build confidence the still really uh, assistance to uh, to go through this whole process. Super, thank you for that. I'm, I'm just, uh, you had used uh, uh, an acronym TESOL. Uh, I think it was TESOL. What does that mean? The teaching English as a second language. Oh, very good. Thank you. Thank you. And both that. of us have, uh, have the TESOL uh, background. So it helps that we have worked together before 
and uh, that we both have that training. Great, thank you for that, I appreciate it. And so I think we'll jump to our Hibbing group and uh, anyone within that group, uh, we certainly would love to hear uh, from Aaron um, as well as the rest of the group. Um, if it's okay, I'll, I'll just quickly sure. tell a little something. I'm kind of thinking of like what we bring. We're trying something new this semester where we have some kids going into intermediate algebra and it's only offered online. So kind of um, for students who haven't had that experience, we are offering that we are having the Zoom shown in our room. So we have um, personal relationships with these students. And so we're kind of able to gather them and bring them in and they already know each other. So they kind of have that classroom feeling um, even though the instructor is on the screen. We've been able to meet with instructor who has been very welcoming to have us in his courses. And it's kind of nice when somebody doesn't show up, Terry or I will, you know, get on our phone and call the student, where are you at? We will get them to come. We have those personal relationships with the students and that's so helpful. Um, where he might not know the students, we can, oh, this student, you know, is this way. And it was just, it's just really nice to have that connection where he would, typically never even really see the students. Um, we help the students set up their computers. If they don't have computers, we fortunately have laptops for them that they can use. Um, he was asking questions and they were trying to verbally say the answers. And Terry has a, had a bunch of whiteboards, little personal whiteboards. And then, you know, we got that out. And so it's really become a very interactive class as well. So just seeing those kind of things happen is, is I kind of think what we bring to the table, just that personal connection that we have with them. Yeah, and it helps that we are from a nonprofit. So we can help our students not only with the academics, but we also help them ap apply for fuel assistance, apply for SNAP benefits. Um, if they're having trouble with transportation, our, our agency has a transit department. So it's a lot of those other things. Sometimes what we do more importantly than the academics is just helping them figure out those things that are going on in life that are keeping them from going to school. Um, and once again, it's just with the nice partnership. So I'm gonna give Aaron some time to talk and Jesslyn, if you want to, and Donna, um, just, you know, um, what, the things that they bring to the table because they also are a big part of adult ed and it's shared students. They're not just our students, they're HCC students. Yeah, thank you, Terry, Jill, and everyone who's presented. I, I, I think the only thing I would add is, is when I look at the success of this partnership, I, I really see it uh, in, in two uh, kind of main categories. One, Jill Carlson touched on it already. It's uh, the flexibility. Uh, of this program. Uh, you heard even uh, when, when she was presenting moments ago, uh, just the willingness to try out uh, new things and innovate uh, semester by semester and, and week by week uh, throughout the decade or, or longer um, uh, time frame of this relationship. It's, uh, it's, it's changed countless times over the years and has been uh, adaptive and responsive uh, to the needs of our students. And, I, and that's been largely driven uh, through Jill and Terry and Donna's engagement. Uh, the other uh, element that I think has just contributed so greatly to the success that you've already heard about. And I can speak to it like Jessalyn. Uh, I also, uh, as an instructor, I uh, was engaged with these learning communities. Uh, but it is in fact, this, this kind of, despite everything else that may be in flux or change one bedrock of this program has been those weekly conversations with Jill and Terry from ABE with our counselors and with our instructors. And uh, it's such a vital opportunity to uh, one, uh, really, um, identify areas where we need to specifically target and support yeah, students, but perhaps just as importantly, develops, I think, a camaraderie, as you're likely sensing, uh, between the college administration, between instructors, and between uh, our, our ABE folks. It, it's just, just been a wonderful team that has uh, uh, grown in, I think, uh, mutual respect and appreciation for one another. Great. Yeah, any polishing statements from others uh, from the college side? I would just mention Donna's role in kind of connecting, being a connecting point. Um, she, you know, for example, Jill just mentioned the scenario we have 
right now kind of piloting this distance uh, approach. And um, Don has been key. And when we set up the, the academic schedule each year saying, hey, you know, this, this might work well um, with, with where Jill and Terry are at and, and, and what might work for students. So when we build the schedule, the academic schedule, Donna's that connecting point. And also just even this year, getting making sure that Jill and Terry have textbooks um, that they can use as they work with students in this class. Thank you, Jesslyn. All right, well, we're gonna leap to question number two. And um, uh, this is something that uh, as we were working on the um, toolkit, sort of, and we were getting experiences from folks, we got this sense that there's certain different degrees of partnership right and so the question here has to do with how would you describe your level of integration between parties so uh and then the scale sort of ranges from there's no real integration with college they're they're sort of standalone um activities and i i think i know the answer to that that um, you've sort of evolved past that <laughs> it maybe started there but if that range to light integration, where there's some AB embedded classroom support, uh, to moderate integration, where there's you know that same embedded classroom support in study skills instruction, to high integration, collaborative, concurrent instruction, uh, co-teaching model. So. Uh, which which of the two of you of the two groups would like to kind of um, leap at that particular um, response? Uh, Russ, yes. I'm going to interrupt again. I think I added this on to that question yesterday as well. Yep. I think what we're really interested in is not only what level of integration, but how did you get to that point? Because We've consistently heard throughout the state with partnerships with those who are trying to form but not yet form is it's difficult to get that trust right on both sides like often the college faculty member who's been teaching for many years can have difficulty when they first you know think about oh my gosh I need to co teach. I forgot to mention I've been teaching for 21 years at Metro State, and I think I would have that same reaction as well. Um, but yet the trust is built. And we have two administrators here today, which we're very fortunate, at least. So Jessalyn and Aaron. And I think if you could add your perspective about how did, what was it, what was the magic at your campus that allowed for such hefty integration? Because when we talk to so many people throughout the state, they say, and especially in ABE, We've tried, but we don't know. We don't know how to get the support. It's all based on getting the administrators' support, and and we don't know how to get it. So that's a multi-pronged question. How did you get to that level of integration? How did your faculty feel trust, and uh, what level of admin support was needed for that? Well, I'll, I'll start I, when when you have people as fabulous as Jill and Terry and. And you see results. People want Jill and Terry to be that. part of, of their work. So, right. I you know, I I just think some of it is really down to um, the approach that Jill and Terry have taken um, as as human beings working with their students as uh, professionals. You know, they're just fabulous professionals to have uh, working alongside you. So so who wouldn't you know want to build that further? Yeah, yeah, as I alluded to, both Jesslyn and myself uh, really began our involvement with this partnership on the instructional side and inherited uh, in our more recent time an admin uh, an already very highly functioning uh, program. And so I, I suppose, Donna, I might defer to you in those initial conversations with uh, Mike Reich, uh, Dean and Provost, and now President of our institution, and perhaps even Ken Simberg, Provost at the time, your recollection of how those conversations maybe first started, if, if you were involved at all. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Nope, nope, you're good. Um, no, I remember, I remember the conference room where we sat down and met for the first time and started talking it through. And it's, like Jill said, we are constantly moving and flexing and making things better or trying something and it crashes and burns. And it's like, well, okay, let's move on. But when it first started, I think it was, you know, the idea, Mike Reich was really 
had done some research on the success of learning communities. And then the thought was, well, let's let's try this with our, our students who need that extra support. And so the first thing was just putting those three classes. And I think maybe there was a math in there too. And Jill, do you remember if, I can't remember if we had that lab part right away with students or if that came a little bit later, but as soon, go ahead, Jill. Do you remember? The lab was right away. Yep, it okay. was. Yep, after the on-course meeting that we had in Grand Rapids, and it kind of set up the whole thing, then I was just invited in. Yeah. Um, yep. and, the, and at first, when we, on the student schedule, it would just say um, reading Monday, Wednesday, Friday at nine o'clock, study skills, Tuesday, Thursday, nine o'clock, and we didn't have the lab listed. And when students didn't see the lab listed, but you just told them about it, they didn't go. So right. now we put it on as part of the class. And then it's like, oh, I have to do this. And so then they end up showing up. And the great thing about Jill and Terry is, you know, that first semester, it's on your schedule, you have to go. And then the second semester that they're at HCC, the next year, the next year, they just automatically go to that room where Jill and Terry are at. They hang out, they rely on them to do homework, they rely on them just for you know, emotional support, or a lot of our students are athletes away from home, um, just to see a friendly face, um, somebody help them out, Jill and Terry have snacks in there. So it's more than just, here's help with your homework, it's, it's help with life during this, when you're part of the HCC journey. We're the aunts. <laughs> you're the aunts. And I have to say, um, you know, from AEOA's point of view also, I mean, number one, yes, AEOA has great staff, um, hands down, but there was seems to have been that respect and professionalism in regards to what ABE could bring to the table. And um, it just was really a good fit. And, um, you know, because as Jessalyn said, uh, you know, there's more than just HCC in the area, and we're trying to build that again. But um, it seems like throughout the years, you know, some things will work, and then it seems like that campus kind of um, the connection isn't as great. And, you know, it's like everything seemed to fit the staff on both sides. Um, the buy-in, um, you know, the benefit, um, you know, it just, it, it seemed like everything was aligned and it has worked so well and it is a best practice. And as they had mentioned, if something doesn't work, you tweak it, you come back, you try something new. It isn't like, okay, you know, ABE really didn't help with this. It's like, no, it, you know, there continues to be, um, you know, they're continuing to move forward and reinventing all the time. And the outcome is, is that it's helping students be successful and the student is the priority and it's working. It works well. Super. Thank you, Tracy, for adding that. I think we'll jump to our Mankato team. Um, and uh, there's a Russ, spoke. Yes, yes. Uh, could I just answer Tony's question real quick? Sure. Um, so Tony is saying that at Normandale, they have a large number of sections of developmental math classes. Um, one thing that we did, because we didn't start out in every class, we're here on campus. Um, what we did is we met with those developmental teachers, found out who was interested in having our help, because it has to be their choice, right? We're, we're coming into the college from the outside. We found out who had students that had the need. And we started out just having like a lab class where they could come in and get extra help to do their classes. We're added on to the, the, um, the D2Ls for each of the um, classes that we work with. So we can see what they have do, what they have to work on, and we can help the students get through their assignments. We help them with due dates. We work on attendance issues, all of that. So that might be somewhere to start in a relationship with AE. A ABE in those classes is just get together with the ABE staff and the developmental teachers and see what you can do to help um, what's best for the students. Yes, Terry, thank Sorry. you for addressing addressing that, um, that chat question. All right, so Mankato, 
Come on down. What have you got to add to this? I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, and, and I think maybe one part, uh, point to begin is kind of set the, the ground uh, foundation on this because I'm just not quite year three now as Dean of Arts and Sciences at South Central College. And so when I came in, as Karen mentioned earlier, some of the groundwork had already been laid because they had received that Bremer grant, which in part had a set of deliverables in it and talked about um, integration and cooperation in that. So that certainly set some, uh, some goals that had to be ascribed to. But since then, we've really worked, I think it's, we've been a, uh, a work in progress and there's been, uh, you know, the flexibility has been built into that. So number one, that certainly makes a working relationship that much better when both sides are quite flexible and saying, okay, let's keep our eye on the ball. What is it the outcome we need to achieve? And the outcomes we set basically at that point in time then were the uh, DESR, the roadmap from Min State. So it's saying, okay, how can we, and, and you know, it's, it's like, a, it's like a, a dozen of eggs, right? You can have all kinds of boxes for your dozen eggs. It's still a dozen, that's your resources. How do you realign them to get them the way you need to get your outcomes? And so that's really the way we've approached it and tried to be flexible as we've gone along. So, and, uh, and, and I think that flexibility and people, the willingness to be open in that regard is probably a big part of, um, of the relationship that, that we've had, that we've been able to grow it. And I'll let other folks jump in here, please. I would love to have Thomas uh, Maldonado talk a little bit about what it was like to teach EAP alone versus when he got to have Tom come into his room and assist. That's a great question. So for me, it was, it was quite difficult. Uh, there was a previous instructor who was a coordinator for EAP, and um, she she was barely working with the integration of AEB in her classroom. Um, I, I, at the time, didn't have it, but um, I'll have to say that it was uh, fairly difficult without that type of support, primarily with areas because of my students being multilingual learners um, and even not having just strong computer skills, not even knowing how to turn on a computer or even you know how to print. Um, all of these things um, are detrimental to being successful in like a, a college writing and grammar class that I teach or oral communication and reading. And I would find that I would teach, give the instruction and assume that the students understood it. And then when deadlines came through, I would see students were not submitting assignments. Um, students just didn't have that uh, type of knowledge to even want to ask. They were very shy to even approach and email me and ask, you know, I don't understand what you explained or I don't know how to submit something in D2L. I don't know how to browse the internet. And so before we had, I had an, uh, the ABE helping with the, the way we have it set up, it was fairly difficult to meet the needs of the students out, out of the classroom. Um, and even in the classroom, I would say at the same time, but once I had, like we had Tom, Tom joining the class, it, there was just a huge difference, um, not only out of class, but in class as well, because the way I have it set up, as, as Tom mentioned, I would give instruction, we'll go into an activity or an exercise, Tom will walk around and make sure the students understood, even myself, you know, if no one understands, please let me know. And I will say that, for example, if, if anyone has no questions, I'll be here um, and, and expect somebody to ask and they won't do, but with Tom walking around, they'll say, Tom, I have a question and they'll pull them to the side. And then when they see that someone's getting help and the other students will say, oh, Thomas, I have a question because they, they know that he's busy and they wanted to ask them, but you know, they're too shy. And so it prompts students to inquire more. Um, and also out of class, this is like the real essential part for me to, like when I teach uh, how to present presentations with Tom helping those students on how to present, how to overcome being nervous and anxiety. Um, you see a huge difference in those presentations when they have that type of support out of class as well. And Tom, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that. I was having trouble with my mic. Uh, no, I just support everything you said, Thomas. Um, and I think uh, something that really helped us is be, uh, the fact that we knew each other ahead of time because uh, we're comfortable working together and I think uh, we can see quite easily when the other person uh, needs an assistant assistance with something. And so we can focus 
really focus on individual student needs uh, by working together. Super. In the spirit of time, I'm going to um, I'm going to move to a couple of questions here that I don't think we've heard as much about because a couple of our questions you've spoken to them. You've already inserted some sort of responses to what we were trying to uncover, and so um, we won't necessarily need to repeat those. Um, but what I would be interested to hear from the group is this whole notion of how does your model benefit the students and um, how is that measured, right? How do you, how have you measured your success, this partnership success, uh, so you, that you know that, um, you know, this commitment of working together makes sense to continue? I heard Jeslyn say, well, when you have these fine individuals that, you know, exceptional individuals that are coming to the experience, why wouldn't we? Well, that's wonderful because it's relationship oriented, but what is the difference? What kind of difference does it make? Uh, and you can prove evidence of it for students. So um, who would like to speak to that? I'll go ahead and speak to that. This is Rick. Um, I think the two goals for us in really thinking, you know, we thought about it in terms again in DESR and what was the, what's the ultimate goal? And it's two things for the students. It's persistence and ultimately receiving an award, whether that's a certificate, a degree, a diploma, whatever it may be, that they leave us with something in hand that will allow them to go out then and take that next step in life's journey in their career. That, so that's really how we thought about this. And so it was thinking twofold is number one, identifying those dropout points where students were dropping out and not persisting. And then secondly, helping them to move forward along, along the, uh, the path. And so the classroom part that you've heard from all of us is that academic side of it that they needed. But the other thing we've been folding in as part of this is bringing in our advisors Okay. and also our academic support center to work with them. And in fact, Karen, uh, uh, Karen can speak to, we're working on another Bremer grant that addresses this further, this, this navigator they need. Because much as they were, students are reluctant say, to talk to Thomas and they have questions, they're also reluctant to talk about their career aspirations. And when they get to these life sticking points outside the classroom that impede their progress. So it's a two, so it's a two-prong approach, the academic side, that partnership and the non-academic side to get them to where they need to go. As far as measuring it, uh, you know, I'd like to say we have all kinds of uh, quantitative evidence at this part. It's, we don't because particularly last year being an outlier with COVID, it right. uh, threw, threw a wrench in the, in the uh, ringer. But I, I have to think Minnesota, we're not that much different than what you see nationally. And nationally, you work back three to five years out. Gosh, you know, that persistence goes up from like the low 20 percentile to like the low 50 percentile. And so that's what I'm hoping to be able to look back three, four years from now and say, OK, we're getting where we should be and what you see nationally. And I'll stop there. Yeah, and, be, and uh, I'm just kind of curious quickly from an ABE perspective. What are the types of measurements that tell you that these students are progressing, that they're, um, they're, they're being successful um, in their progression of learning? So I can well, speak. Oh, go oh, ahead, ahead, Karen. <laughs> um, you know, ABE measures uh, the measurable skills gains, of course. Um, but also, we take a survey um, at the end of each class. Thomas, do you want to talk a little bit about the survey? That'd be great. Um, in regards to the the survey that was that was taken by ABE, or my um, question? Both. I think both. Okay. So um, the ABE, Tom administered a um, a survey for the students to ask to gauge how they felt about Tom being in the classroom and then out of the classroom. Um, and, and Tom could probably speak to this if he would like to. 
the the results of that were favorable. The students held highly that it was something that they deemed important in the class. Um, and, and to add to that, every semester I have a questionnaire basically where I revisit the objectives of the syllabus and make sure that the students understood, did I hit all of those areas? And not only did, did I hit those areas, did you also understand those areas? And do you understand what you got from the course based on those objectives and based on what we covered in class? And in addition to any other skills that they learned as well, computer-wise um, or, or academic-wise. And it always comes back, the, the one thing I'll say about my students is they're very honest when it comes to learning something or not learning something. And what usually comes back, um, no, I, either I don't feel you, you didn't teach me or uh, I feel I didn't learn it myself. And mostly I noticed with having ABE in the classroom, the most of the responses from the students are, uh, if they felt they didn't learn something, it was because it was their, um, it was something on their side where they didn't uh, either take time to learn more or they didn't uh, explore it, or maybe there was something that prevented them from learning more. And there was less of blaming the teacher. Oh, the teacher didn't teach me right. No, the teacher instructed me right. We had tutoring support. Uh, we also had the ASC to help us. And um, it, it, it just shows that they were advancing and developing, progressing to the next level where they needed to be in our EAB program. Yes, thank you so much for that. It looks like Tom wants to contribute something. I, just a couple things. Uh, yeah. As Karen said, uh, from the ABS, ABE side, we we pre-test and post-test each uh, each course, so we we can evaluate the progress we see from that. Thomas mentioned the surveys that we do. Uh, Rick mentioned persistence, and uh, I've always believed that. Uh, self-confidence leads to persistence. And uh, I think that's what we're achieving in these classes as we work together. These students feel much more self-confidence at the end of the semester, and that is going to enable them to persist. They're going to be want to move on to the next step. So from the giving side, is there anything that you would quickly reinforce or say in addition to what has already been shared. This is what we'd like to contribute to this measurement discussion. Our big thing is having the learning community meetings with everybody who's involved in those developmental classes. That's where we get a lot of the feedback on how it is affecting our students. Um, the other thing we do a, we call it overtime with our college athletes because there were a lot of athletes that were not eligible after the first semester. And since we started that, the numbers of athletes that have been eligible for the second semester has gone up. Um, so that, that's another way. Of course, we do the NRS measurements, the pre and post testing, but that doesn't yes. give us much information as the other things do. Okay, that's great. All right, so um, we're, we're nearing the end of this time, but I think we're gonna spill just a little bit um, into evolution. So when you think about where you've been and where you would like to be, uh, tell us a little bit about that, that sort of what's next, right? Um, and I'm just going to preface it by saying um, it's wonderful to hear that it's relationship oriented, that there's, a, there's this commitment to work professionally together um, it's refreshing, <laughs> to be honest, um, and, and yet there's some vulnerabilities in that model sometimes around that there are personal champions that um, are involved in making this continue to happen. Um, I'm just wondering about your discussion around making the leap to an institutional champion around this work, right? So that has the, uh, the likelihood that it's going to survive when any one of you um, exits, right? So can each of your groups speak to that? And uh, Karen, yeah, it looks like yeah. you're ready to leap in, good. Um, Rick and I each have a comment to make about this one. I would say, you know, we have enough structures in place and have a long enough history that we have already had turnover in our program and it has survived and actually thrived. Um, as you know, this started before Rick, it started before Tom and Thomas. 
Um, and so right now, I would say Rick is really the champion. He's leading the DS, DESR meetings. He involves ABE in every one of those. We meet monthly. We plan together. We are currently working on a Bremer grant for next school year to hire an ABE SCC navigator that would work back and forth between our systems and help the students who are in those classes. Uh, really with motivation, making a career plan and moving forward and all the connections that Terry was talking about when she described the need for that navigation uh, earlier in the call. So we have a lot of plans for next year. Rick wants to just say what we're doing with um, accelerating our relationship with the DESR as well. That'd be great to hear. Thank you. Just to add quickly here, I, I think the big thing is um, our relationship will continue to evolve and we try to be as inclusive as possible as Karen spoke to the team, but also we've got things. Um, in fact, we've emailed on this Russ with regards to like the math pathways. That's the next step. And the thing I've really been try to really be um, to embed across the leadership across the college is that, hey, we're being asked to accelerate students more quickly through developmental education to get them into co-requisite learning so they can complete their math and their other courses more quickly. We aren't gonna be able to do that without this continued and strengthening of this relationship we have with, with ABE. It's essential to our success. And so we need to continue that relationship because these students and no one instructor can do it on their own. So we need to have that partnership if we're gonna make, really make this happen. So thank you so much for that, Rick. Um, Hibbing, what's your sort of spin on this side of it? What are, what are you folks thinking? And, and maybe in the process of doing? Well, as Jessalyn alluded to, uh, we are in the process of expanding uh, the program to our, our sister colleges and soon to be sister campuses for our merged yeah. institutions. So that is, uh, that's, a, that's a significant next step, I would say, in further solidifying uh, the, the partnership and the importance, importance for each of our campuses. I think the other thing that really has helped in that regard is, quite frankly, the commitment of, of resources to a program like this. Uh, that once, once a program is established and there's rooms, there's technology, there's folks on campus, it's, it's a lot harder to just um, disassociate or distance uh, the, the campus from, from that sort of commitment. So I would say, in addition to all the, the more soft elements, the relational pieces that we've spoken to, I think a firmer commitment on the resource side really helps to solidify uh, this program. Yep. Anything to add to that, Jesslyn? No, I, I think those are big pieces of it. And I'm, I'm hoping that um, just with some of the lessons learned here at Hibbing, we can um, translate that out to, to some of the other campuses that are part of our, our merger. And I, great, but, yep. Go I ahead. would just like to add that ABE takes some responsibility in this also. Um, there's constantly a change in the instructors at, at the college level and it's our job. They don't know who we are necessarily coming in. So it's our job to make a list of who are the new instructors in campus that we might work with and going and introducing ourselves and, and getting that conversation going um, so that we're not losing ground when somebody new comes in. And I, in my yeah. comment in the comments is um, having college staff involved in the hiring process for ABE teachers when there's turnover on that side, they know what qualities work for them and they can help look for um, candidates that have those same qualities. Yeah, that's wonderful. I've noticed that too, thank you. And so at, at this point, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna kind of uh, shift and hand it off to Leslie. And Leslie, I'm wondering if there's anything in chat that you think needs to be spoken to. Um, and, uh, and then we can, if we have time, um, we could perhaps just open it up just a bit, but it's uh, up maybe, for you to decide how, how we manage that aspect of it. Sure, thanks, uh, Russ. I did not see anything in chat that hasn't been addressed already. Yep. Um, so that's great that some of you fielded the questions on the fly. Um, so at this point, we can open it wide open to all the participants, either for questions, Q&A, or just to add comments on your own. Um, it, I mean, this is your dialogue time as well. Does anyone have anything 
they'd like to speak about? Tony has heard. his hand raised. Oh, yeah, oh hi, yes. this is, hi, hey, Tony, Tony Dunlop, uh, math faculty from, from Normandale. I would just like to ask, uh, I wanna make sure I understood the response to my question um, accurately. So these add-on lab classes, which I assume were, you know, the study skills, the life skills that, that, that are so crucial to success in developmental ed, were those open? Um, I, I'm sorry, I didn't write down who answered my question. Were those open to any student from any section? And if the answer to that is yes, I have a follow-up question. Um, yes, we open up our, our lab time to anybody. It's not just the English, it's not just math, it's anybody who needs help. If we have a lot of them that are coming from the same class, then we will make a, a special class just for them. Okay, and so then the follow-up question is, um, that sounds like it's heavily dependent on self-motivated students. So, which is, as we've heard today, that's one of the big issues is students are bashful or shy or afraid to ask for help. So do you have a way that you reach, I'm, I'm not, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but these oh, are no, the no. things that pop into my mind. Um, we're extremely invasive as Jill would say. Okay. <laughs> so we, the big thing is developing the relationship with students, but we will do things like if they don't show up for class, we send them a text. Um, we send them pictures of their empty seat and say, why aren't you in this? Um, <laughs> We, I've been known to go to the dorm and find them in their room because they live close. Why aren't they in class? Um, Jill will send them text after text after text till they get tired of it and they, they come in. Um, so we have a lot of tricks up our sleeve for getting them involved when they are trying to be uninvolved. Yeah, so that's not a job for an introvert like me. I would have to find a partner. Who <laughs> yeah, I am a forced extrovert, so I'm feeling it. Great, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think on the college side, they call that intrusive counseling, don't they? <laughs> Something along that line. So thank you for that, that's wonderful. Um, yes, raise your hand or just jump on in. Um, if you've got something to talk about. I think, Jill, you're ready to go. Yeah, I just quickly wanted to say that the uh, weekly meetings that we have are just absolutely imperative because that's where we can catch them before they fail. So when you talk about persistence and you know a, a teacher might, oh, wow, you know, I've got somebody that hasn't turned three things in. I wonder what's going on with them. Chances are in our meeting, Donna might know what's going on. Terry or I might know what's going on. And then um, when we see them, then we, you know, steer them. I think it was Thomas had said, you know, they didn't know how to do their D2L. Well, we can catch that, you know, catch that before it becomes a problem. And that's, that's a big thing. You know, they are not going to volunteer that they don't know how to do something. Um, so it's helpful to have that weekly meeting to see where they are what's missing that type of thing and i just wanted to say that that's so important that's wonderful all right so um a round of applause for thomas tom rick karen tracy aaron donna terry jill and jeslyn thank you really so much for being with us today and um you know taking the time from your busy lives to, to share um, your experiences. It's just tremendous, tremendous um, for, for people to hear this. And so um, with that, I think we'll hand it off to Leslie. There's a few kind of polishing things that I know Leslie wants to speak to. And so take it away, Leslie. Sure, uh, of course, wouldn't you know that the garbage truck is coming right now if you hear extra noise <laughs> right at this moment. Um, anyway, uh, I don't have a lot. I What I like to uh, end every meeting with is uh, a reminder that uh, there is a website, you know, to go to. It's a OneNote or a OneDrive site uh, for the Affinity Group, and I'll take you there in a minute. For anyone who's new today, or for any of you, the panelists, if you'd like to join these month, they're not monthly. Uh, this year we're having five, uh, so two in the fall and three in the spring semester. If you'd like to join us, shoot Russ an email and copy me. And um, Russ, if you could put your email 
in there and I'll try to get mine in. But let me just show you the website and then it, it shows you when the upcoming meetings are. Um, so here it is. It's not an open site. That's why we ask you to shoot us an email. I have to give permissions to let you in. And uh, you can find the history of the meetings as well as upcoming meetings. So if we go to fiscal year or academic year 21-22, uh, uh, and you can see here's today's meeting. Um, I will, oh, it's running a little slow today. Um, uh, I've got the agenda and the kinds of questions we ask, and then I'll be populating it with a few notes. But our very next meeting will be, this is uh, at a glance. Here we go. So, um, we, our next meeting will be March 3rd and 4th, and you can pick whichever day works for your schedule. They, we offer the same content both days or mostly the same content. Uh, and then our final meeting will be April 20, 21st and 29th. Um, and Russ, uh, we have just a couple minutes. What we haven't done is, and let me keep that up there. We haven't solidified yet how we're gonna spend time in those meetings. We have generated a number of ideas, but I'm wondering if there's a minute or two where we just wanna throw that open to say, has anything popped up as either a new or pressing topic that you'd like us, or format of a meeting that you'd like us to be able to start planning on or start planning? I'm just, uh... One, one thing that just uh, occurred to me when I heard Rick uh, speak about the DESR, um, you know, the DESR sort of developmental education strategic roadmap sort of uh, popped up here, you know, a few years back, and there's been this sort of evolution over time uh, to get us to a certain place. And um, I, I don't even really know myself what the status of that is <laughs> you know um, where we're at with it, uh, where campuses are at with it. Um, part of me is wondering if um, if it would be good to have a little touch point about that, um, because it sounds like in your area, Rick and Karen, it's a pretty uh, important foundational thing for you to be that fuels your work, right? That you're using that structure of that. Um, and I don't know if that's the case around the state. Um, I, I don't know if it could lend some support to some groups uh, that are out there in terms of getting their work sort of um, more formalized. So that's one thought that just occurred to me. Well, we have been in communications with um... <clears throat> the uh, administrator at the uh, system office of Minnesota State who's taken over for Greg Raythert, uh, we could maybe invite her. Um, I don't know what we'd do with it, but would it be useful to, to folks to hear from a variety of people about how DESR is overlaying with, uh, we do know we have nine, we've identified 19 colleges in the Min State system who have some partnership to some degree, varying degrees with ABE. That's 19 two-year colleges out of the 30 two-year colleges. So it's better than half. We don't know what's going on in the other colleges. I mean, we could reach out to Min State, we could reach out to campus administrators on some level and, and hear more about how they're accomplishing the work of the DESR. They all have to report on, uh, I, it's annually, correct? Aaron and Jocelyn, I think annually you have to provide a report about how you're reforming, or I hate to use the word reforming dev ed, but it's, you know, how are you improving dev ed? What, because it's up to each college to do it however they wish to do it. Is that a useful topic for people? Maybe you can just raise your hand or type yes. I'm seeing a lot of head nods for those of you who have video. Okay. Could, could I could I add something real quick on that? Um, yeah. Just that DESR really now is at a pivot point okay. because our, our we just submitted for I'll call it the 
DESR 1.0. We just submitted our final reports in December. Okay. Now we're going on to what I'll call DESR 2.0, which starts with the math pathways. Oh, so got it. if you're thinking about it that way, it's kind of like, well, what did we do and what do we get out of it? And what's next and why are we doing that? You know, that might yeah. be a way to frame it. Yeah, I like yeah. that. It's, it's sort of like implications or opportunities, right? You know, that, that, are, that come at this stage of the game. All right, so I think, uh, thank you so much, folks. If you've got any other ideas, uh, you can email me, please. Um, let me know. And uh, we've got two sets of meetings coming up. We're, we're, you know, we're open to your suggestions and want this to be useful to you. Um, and so at this stage, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop our recording. I want to thank everyone for coming. And...